Hello, everyone. Welcome um, to the Wednesday morning plenary. So you were just watching a bunch of lightning talks. And if you miss them, the stories, those lightning stories are linked on the website and also in the Slack channel. My name is Melissa Graham, and I work for the LSST Rubin Observatory Data Management Team um, at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm just going to give you your morning announcements and reminders. So the first reminder is that all sessions are being recorded um, and that the recordings are posted the next day. So yesterday's recordings are already posted on the website and in some of the Slack channels. Um, the second reminder is for all of our session chairs out there that the last session on Friday is the breakout summaries. And so all session chairs are responsible for creating a summary slide and speaking to it in that session, except for our wonderful Rubin Research Bites parallel uh, session chairs. I'll make one slide just for all of the, the RRB sessions for us for that. The other reminder is that um, there is a Zoom prep room. If you have any questions about how Zoom works or you just want to test your audio and video, you can go to that prep room and it's um, staffed at 1.30 p.m. Pacific every day for you to do checks. Um, and that's for checking for um, using Zoom meetings, whereas this is a Zoom webinar during which all of you attendees are muted and you'll be using instead the Q&A within Zoom. You'll see a little button that says Q&A down at the bottom. Use that Q&A to ask questions or you can post your questions into the Slack channel for this plenary and they are being moderated by our speakers today and will be chosen to be spoken out loud and answered live um, during the session, or if they're in Slack, discussions can you continue afterwards and throughout the week. So keep participating via Slack even after this webinar. And speaking of participation and interaction, as a reminder that you did sign a code of conduct and agree to abide by it when you registered. If you forget what's in that code of conduct, you can go to the Maine Rubin Observatory PCW website and find it under the main menu bar where it says resources, you will find the code of conduct. If you experience or witness any violations of the code of conduct, there are people serving as designated um, points of, uh, of contact who welcome you to reach out to them. Oh, thank you, Fed, I see you're sharing the slide for that. There are people who um, are serving as points of contact for that who want to be um, contacted and, and told about these um, any occurrences. So please do reach out if that happens. Another reminder that um, in Slack, there is a channel called General where we'll be making announcements when, um, when sessions are starting, that kind of thing. If you need help with anything or have questions about how any of this works, there is a Slack channel called Help where you can message us at any time. We're always watching it to uh, make sure things are running smoothly. Final reminder for Friday, um, we are, have all been tasked with homework for the diversity, equity, and inclusion session. You've been receiving emails from Fed and Keith throughout the week uh, with that homework. So please take a look at it, read the emails, um, and participate in that session. That is all of the reminders and announcements that I have today. So um, today's morning plenary um, is going to is brought to you by the Science Collaborations. So this is kind of an initiative we started last year. Oh, I forgot to mention I'm also the chair of the Science Organizing Committee, which is why I'm doing your morning announcements today. And last year, the SOC for the PCW, um, one of our initiatives was to bring the science collaborations into the plenaries and have them present on their work, their challenges, their activities, what they're doing. And so that's the whole focus of this morning's plenary. So I'm going to turn it over now to the science collaborations coordinator, Federica Bianco, who's going to um, moderate this whole session for you. Fed? You are muted. Okay, there we go. Hello. Again, it's not like I'm not on Zoom all day, every day, but I still apparently need to learn. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you about the science collaboration of Rubin Observatory. Um, I speak to you as the science collaborations coordinator. I'm also the co-chair of one of the science collaborations, the Transcendence and Variable Star Science Collaboration. 
So to explain what the science collaboration are, let me remind you that the NSF and DOE funding for Rubin Observatory extends to the construction of Rubin and the operation of the survey, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST, which will run for the first 10 years of the observatory's life. However, there is no dedicated funds that support the science exploitation of the LSST data. In other words, because the data from the survey is public to all scientists in the US and Chile, um, and, and, it can be, and the data rights can be acquired by international partners, the responsibility of turning the LSST data into science results falls on the people that are the recipient of this data. So um, a large swath of the science community that was interested in both preparing for this survey and making sure that this survey can reach its potential and be really as transformational as we all hope um, and think it can be, organized in eight team, the science collaborations. They're self-managed, self-governed science team. Um, and you can think of them as uh, more or less as a grassroots movement. We work in concert with Rubin to both assure that the observatory is uh, reaching its potential and to prepare for delivering the science from the beginning of the survey. The, the teams are different in size. They range from um, a few tens to a couple hundreds. Here you see the size on the right hand side. And when you see a bar that is split into two, it shows the growth of the teams over the last year. So some of our teams are growing very rapidly. Um, also, you see the dark energy science collaboration that might be the, the science collaboration you're most familiar with, uh, which is not overwhelming the chart. Uh, in fact, the desk has a two tier membership. And if you sum up all the people that are in both tiers, you end up with um, over a thousand people. So here I'm just showing um, the, core, the, um, the full members of desk whereas I'm showing all the members of the other science collaborations. The science collaborations are organized by science interest and expertise. So we have an AGN science collaborations, the desk dark energy science collaboration, galaxy science collaboration, solar system science collaboration, stars Milky Way local volume, strong lensing and transients and variable stars, and also the informatic and statistics science collaboration that instead of connecting people that have domain expertise and interest, collects experts in methodology and serves as a support for all the other science collaboration on your favorite data science and machine learning problems. Altogether, it's about 1,500 members that includes physicists, astronomers, data scientists, science software engineers. We have representation in, in five continents, over 20 countries. And if you think about the themes, uh, the core sort of science pillars, the themes that the that Rubin Observatory is designed to specifically pursue, which I want to remind you, are studying the structure of the Milky Way by a resolved stellar population, studying the nature of dark energy and dark matter, exploring the transient and variable universe, and creating an unprecedented complete, uh, complete inventory of solar system objects from near asteroids to outer solar system objects, unprecedentedly complete, sorry. So if you think about these four science teams and the names of the science collaboration that I mentioned earlier, there is an obvious correspondence between some of them. TVS is interested with the exploration of the transient and variable universe, desk with dark energy and dark matter nature, star, stars Milky Way and local volume with our own galaxy and solar system with the solar system. However, um, you, if you think about it a bit more deeply, you can imagine that a lot of the science collaborations also have the interests in some of the other science domains and that all the other science collaborations also cover um, some aspects and um, of these particular science pillars. So that provides a, um, an organization that is a very uh, intricated network. And on the right hand side, you see a representation of the science collaboration as a network where the larger dots are the eight science collaborations and the smaller dots are all the participants. So we have uh, membership in more than one science collaboration in many cases, and we function really as a network of networks that is interconnected and that supports exchange of information and expertise. So what do we do? We provide expert opinion and analysis for Rubin whenever we are asked for. We have uh, 
we have contributed information, analysis, opinion, and expertise uh, to the design of the survey, uh, to the design of the data products, etc. We are involved in most of the grouping committees that you may hear about during this committee. Um, we have chairs of science collaborations on the SAC. The committee that evaluates in-kind contributions from international partners is largely populated by science collaboration members, uh, as well as community members, and it has representation of all the science collaboration members, etc. We're also involved with the corporation. Um, we have representation on the, on the LSST Corporation Executive Board, and we have a committee of a, an advisory committee of the um, corporation made by chairs so that we can help um, design the portfolio of fundraising of the corporation and uh, and also the corporation can help us in the fundraising to pursue the science that we want to pursue. We have produced a number of, um, of uh, we have produced literature in support of Rubin and uh, in support of the design and, and ideation of Rubin, um, as well as more specifically the survey, for example, the science book and the COSAT, which is an open paper that continues to be updated with survey strategy metrics. Uh, we work on fundraising with the corporation and we also have a truly a mission of training and supporting our scientists, including new scientists that enter the Rubin environment with workshops, hackathons, tutorials, data challenges, staff club, um, etc. So why should you become a member of a science collaboration? And it occurred to me more, uh, more clearly uh, recently than before that people may be reluctant in joining a, co a collaboration of any kind because they may not understand uh, why they should join a science collaboration when the Rubin data is actually public and they can access it, of course, as they should, without at all needing to be interacting with the science collaborations. However, the science collaborations are a very supportive and collaborative environment that is working on figuring out how we turn the Rubin data into science. It's producing software and it's producing knowledge for its members, also for the rest of the world. Most of our products become world public and can be benefited by anybody that is interested in Rubin. Uh, but the network of support that we provide to increase our knowledge um, is fostered inside of the science collaboration. So the science collaboration are the best environment, in my opinion, um, if you want to turn LSST data into science. Of course, the science collaboration interact with the Rubin Observatory um, community engagement team. We're very excited about this new team of Rubin that will serve the entire scientific community. Uh, this team is not dedicated at all to serving the science collaboration, but as part of the scientific community is organized in the science collaboration, we obviously have common interest um, and we can coordinate our efforts to maximize the throughput of both science teams. We can work together to identify complementary and collaborative, collaborative initiatives uh, that can truly make the Rubin Observatory transformational. Um, anybody can become a member if you hold data rights to Rubin. There are no membership fees. There are no requirements to being affiliated with any specific organization, including the corporation um, or any, any university that is associated in any way with Rubin. There are no requirements of minimum time commitment to participate in any of the science collaborations. This wasn't true in the past. In the past, the minimum time commitment was required by some of the science collaborations, but all science collaborations have, have now a very low entry level. And some have multi-tier membership that enables a deeper connection if you are willing to commit more time. Uh, this is my timer and it's okay because I'm almost done. Um, I, this is an example of the application process for the solar system science collaboration. I want to focus on one on sentence only. Um, the current guideline on memberships are focused on community building and involvement. So we are very, um, we're very inclusive and a very open organization and we do encourage you uh, to contact us, reach out to each science collaboration on our websites if you're interested in that particular science domain. Um, I will pass the virtual microphone to the science collaboration chairs. Uh, the rest of the session will work as follows. There will be two brief presentations from uh, about two science collaboration. Typically those will be done by one of the 
typically two science collaboration chairs. Um, after each pair of science collaboration talk, we will pause for questions. So now is a great time to ask questions for the next set of science collaborations, which are DESK and TDS. A reminder that you can ask questions on this Q&A or on, this, on the Slack. We don't have a lot of time to answer a lot of questions, but those that are not answered live will be answered on Slack um, throughout the rest of the day. With that, I'm going to call Rachel Mandelbaum. Thanks, Fed. Uh, do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you. And hi, everyone. I'm going to tell you about the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, or DESK. So I'm Rachel Mandelbaum, the DESK spokesperson. Can you go back a slide? Sorry. Um, and uh, Pat Burkett is the deputy spokesperson of DESK. Um, our collaboration has close to 1,000 members of whom over 200 are full members who've made an additional commitment to the collaboration. Desk members are broadly distributed geographically, as you can see on the pie chart on the right. Scientifically, Desk focuses on the, can you go back? Sorry. Scientifically, Desk focuses on the use of LSST data to study observable signatures of dark sector physics, including and beyond dark energy. Our goal is to make high accuracy, high precision measurements of fundamental cosmological parameters using LSST data by combining five complementary probes, galaxy clusters, large scale structure, supernovae, strong and weak gravitational lensing. <clears throat> LSST has the potential to transform our understanding of dark sector physics and DESK is carrying out some of the essential preparation to make the most of a remarkable data set. Next slide, please. DESK has a science roadmap that describes our research priorities along with infrastructure work in the form of software and data set deliverables. Ongoing activities include development of high fidelity extragalactic and image simulation tools, large scale production of simulated images and image processing with Rubin's LSST science pipelines. The image on the left is an example of a simulation of the static sky then with transients added. And finally, without the static skies, you can see the tree rings in the simulated detectors. We're also developing analysis and systematics mitigation methodology, implementing it into our software pipelines and validating those pipelines against the aforementioned simulations and against data from precursor surveys. And finally, we're engaging with Rubin Observatory in a variety of ways, for example, regarding observing strategy. Recent new initiatives include a meetings accessibility committee, which is focused on optimizing the experience of remote participation in collaboration meetings, and a new equity, diversity, and inclusion committee, which is charged to proactively ensure that the collaboration is fostering an inclusive environment while promoting equity and diversity. Next slide, please. As DESK continues its preparatory activities, we're engaging with groups outside of DESK, including Rubin Observatory, the other LSST science collaborations, and groups with relevant data sets beyond LSST. Besides recent cross science collaboration interactions shown on the slide, We've recently received LSSTC enabling science funds to organize a topical cross science collaboration workshop in 2021. Collaboration with other groups within, within the Rubin ecosystem on essential structural issues such as equity, diversity, inclusion would also be welcome. Our public web page has a number of resources that I highly encourage you to check out as noted on the slide. If you'd like to learn more about DESK, please do browse our web page and especially our handy intro to DESK slides to see whether it might be a good fit for your interests. The slide has links you can follow to learn how to apply for membership or for time limited observer status for PIs in the process of seeking data rights. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And next is Rachel Street from the Transient and Variable Star Science Collaboration. Hello, everyone. So as Fred said, um, Federica and myself are the, the co-coordinators of the Transients and Variable Stars Science Collaborations. Uh, we have over 260 members which reflects the very wide range of the science interests that we represent. This includes uh, both the transient science and variable phenomena in both the galactic and extragalactic contexts. So you can imagine that we cover the LSST data product from both the alert and the catalog uh, information. Naturally, given the nature of our science, we're also heavily involved in the preparations for the timely classification and uh, follow-up observing necessary to really uh, characterize all of these different phenomena. Oh, next slide, Fred, please. So we have a number of active projects going on at the moment, too many to cover, so I wanted to focus on two areas in particular. Uh, 
we just held a metrics hackathon which was designed to help the science community to write the metrics that will be used to evaluate the LSST survey strategy in particular. This is an area where our members have been extremely active over the last uh, couple of years, in particular the um, groups looking into galactic variability, a range of transients including tidal disruption events, microlensing, and we have a, a new group as of last year focusing on looking for real novelties in the LSST data, the real um, new phenomena and new science. But the hackathon we hosted last week was uh, designed to reach out not just for our own science collaboration, but um, to the other SCs as well. We've also been active in looking at the early phase observations. This is essential to a lot of our science in many different ways, but particularly the transient science. Uh, so the acquisition strategy for template images, which will allow the alerts to be produced, uh, is crucially important to us. So we recently published two research notes on that topic. We have also have a strong interest in justice, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, so we have formed a group very similar to desks along these lines, focusing on looking at the accessibility and transparency of TBS. Um, also looking at our climate and making sure that we're really fostering an inclusive uh, atmosphere and looking at practical ways in which we can enhance um, and broaden the demographic of our membership and the involvement of underrepresented groups. Next slide, please. The TBS is structured into 15 topical subgroups, mostly by domain area, which you can see on the left-hand side there. Uh, but we also have a group focused on the characterization um, and classification, which has recently been revitalized. So I encourage you to get involved in that because it obviously touches on a lot of the science that we do. We also form task forces. These are done annually and they're arranged around a specific goal, a scientific goal, which is usually of interest to a lot of people. And so they're deliberately interdisciplinary. And the sum on the right shows you some of the active task forces that we've had so far. I mentioned metrics already. I touched on the, the early phase and commissioning observations, but we also have um, active groups looking at brokers, crowded field photometry and the science platform, as well as a, a roadmap to TVS science as a whole. Next slide, please. So looking to the future, we have many active uh, avenues of research going on and we have a lot of very keen members. Um, so we're looking for funding to be really more effective in the future. We have a very active, uh, what we call our JEDI group. Um, we would welcome collaboration with similar groups across the Rubin Observatory. And we've been actively seeking cross fertilization with some of the other science collaborations. We've hosted joint workshops in the past and we'll do so again in the future with this next with the Strong Lensing Science Collaboration. We have a two tier membership to recognize outstanding commitments, but we have no minimum commitment and we welcome new members. Um, and we welcome members from the other science collaborations to ensure that interdisciplinary aspects. Please check out our website for more information. Thank you. Thank you both Rachel. And uh, we had time for one quick question for each science collaborations. Pat, who is the deputy spokesperson of DESK is moderating. Do you have a question for, for DESK? Right, so a couple of general questions have come up in, but um, I think I'm gonna ask Rachel a more specific one that I think will be useful. Um, Rachel, if there are uh, collaborate, uh, other scientists out there who are interested in desk tools, like the many things that are being developed, but don't have a particular interest in dark energy and kind of the scope of, of desk, how best can they engage uh, in um, benefiting from those tools? Uh, thanks, Pat. That's a great question. Um, so uh, there is a link to our web page on my slide and also to our Zenodo page and um, some and to our GitHub organization. So um, there are a number of desk software tools and um, data sets that have been made public. Um, generally, you know, that's evident on Zenodo or through some release paper or something like that. So I encourage people who are interested to know more about that to check out our webpage and follow those links. Um, you know, there is a 
a general interest in um, providing tools and data sets and so on to the community. And so we try to make that um, pretty visible and easy for, for people to find. Uh, great. There's a question. There's a few questions for TVS. In the interest of time, I will ask it and answer it myself as co-chair of TVS. One question is: Do we work on light echoes, which are a time-dependent, time-variable, but diffuse phenomenon? And the answer is yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, I work on light echoes, and my student Jalon Ling gave a research write on what we plan to do within TVS for, and within my group for light echoes with Rubin LSST data. And with that, uh, we're on to the AGN science collaboration and the strong lens in science collaboration. So the mic goes to Neon Brand. Hi. So I'd like to tell you about the active galactic nuclei uh, science collaboration. I'm Neil Brandt. I'm, I'm the chair of the science collaboration. Uh, we currently have about 80 members. And so we're, I guess, one of the smaller science collaborations now, although we continue to rapidly grow. But over the past year, we've probably added 30% new members. So we're still rapidly growing by accretion, I guess. And we have uh, as our core goals to maximize the AGN science return of LSST and to educate the broader community about, about this science. Um, and we expect that LSST will have a, will provide a lot of very exciting uh, advances in AGN science. It will generate truly massive AGN samples. When you bring in all the multi-wavelength data, 50 plus million AGN are expected to be found, reaching out to very high redshifts, uh, allowing us to explore a supermassive black hole growth across a wide range of cosmic environments. We also expect to perform uh, superior time domain based studies, including general AGN variability to learn about their accretion disk structures, for example, to um, support multi object uh, spectrometer reverberation mapping efforts, uh, to, to perform microlensing based studies to look for supermassive black hole binaries. And then we also are excited about supermassive black hole transients, including things like tidal disruption events, accretion disk instabilities, blazar flares, and such. And for much more about the science, which I can't go into now, of course, I, I will point you to uh, YouTube, where if you just search on LSST AGN, there's about 12 plus hours of content there including about nine hours from a recent uh, AAS meeting in a meeting where we had uh, about 16 talks that covered a lot of the, the exciting science in some detail. Uh, next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> our activities uh, in involve uh, many things. We, we have been, uh, I'd say, playing a leading role among the science collaborations and gathering extensive multi-wavelength data for, for example, the deep drilling fields. And this clearly is necessitated by the strong multi-wavelength nature of, of, of AGN emission generally. Uh, we've gathered via a large XMM-Newton program, a ground truth sample of X-ray selected active galaxies. Uh, Spitzer, uh, led by Mark Lacey, has now covered um, three of the deep drilling fields fully to, to very high sensitivity, and that will be extremely valuable as soon as LSST switches on. We'll have all this multi-wavelength data lined up and ready to go. Um, we also, in the AGN Science Collaboration, led three of the survey cadence white papers, and we're participating in ongoing cadence assessments. Um, we uh, have prioritized our science goals in, in a roadmap, which is publicly available. Uh, we, of course, perform service to the various uh, project committees, uh, the Contribution Evaluation Committee, the Rubin Euclid Data Products Committee, and such. Um, and we, we, with kind uh, financial support from the LSST Corporation via an enabling science proposal, we are going to be running a, an AGN uh, science collaboration data challenge. And this will involve analyses in the XMM, LSS, Cosmos, and Stripe 82 regions, regions that already have uh, data ready, uh, available and ready to go for, for this work. Uh, we have regular telecons and occasional meetings, including, for example, that meeting at a meeting at AAS 236 that I just referred to. And we regularly perform outreach to AGN astronomers worldwide, giving talks at AGN conferences so people who are excited about LSST and want to learn more have an opportunity to, to do so. Uh, next slide. And so for the, for the future, well, clearly we plan to continue the critical work on cadence optimization to make sure, make sure AGN science is well represented there. We are going to continue gathering multi-wavelength data in preparation for observations, especially in the deep drilling fields. So we'll be ready to go uh, straight out of the gate. Uh, this includes, for example, large-scale spectroscopic redshifts in the, in the um, deep drilling fields. 
We um, are working to improve uh, training of AGN selection methods using the ground truth AGN samples that we've now generated that I referred to. Um, an another big challenge is to derive optimized photometric redshifts for AGNs, spanning the full range of AGN luminosities from powerful quasars, where of course the, the, the AGN dominates the system, down to lower luminosity active galaxies where the host is providing a substantial or a dominant contribution of the light. And then of course, we hope to continue having regular science and working meetings. Um, as Federica already mentioned, I, I would say that we greatly need improved financial support. It's clear we have an enormous amount of work on our plate. We'd like to do even more than we're doing, but without the financial resources, it's, it's proving to be a great challenge for us. Um, and finally, I'll say that AGN astronomers worldwide who would like to actively contribute to the AGN science collaboration are certainly welcome to apply for associate membership uh, at the link that, that's given at the bottom. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we are moving on to the Strong Lens in Science collaboration with Aprajita Verma. Hi, I'm Aprajita Verma, and along with Timo Angita, we are the co-chairs of the Strong Lensing Science Collaboration, now the baby of all the other science collaborations. We have about 60 members. Um, we're keen to grow, so um, I'll come to how you can join in the last slide. Um, so in terms of our science drivers, there are many Strong Lensing Science drivers, particularly for uh, Rubin, it's going to be transformational in terms of the size of samples of strong lenses that we're going to find. We're moving from um, kind of situations of a thousand strong lenses to uh, 10 to the four to 10 to the five. And that's really going to change the way that we use strong lensing tools. In particular, we have so many different science goals that you can imagine that sample of a thousand is spread over many different science themes. Uh, but with Rubin data, we'll be able to really change the field. Um, so here's just a selection of some of those science drivers. Um, we'll be able to do galaxy masses and structures, both light and dark matter in 10 to the four to 10 to the five lenses. Um, there's a strong case in cosmography using lens quasars, lens supernovae and other lens transients that's uh, within the domain of the Death Strong Lensing Working Group with whom we work with very closely. Um, we'll also be looking at cluster mass functions and getting constraints from joint strong lensing and weak lensing analysis in about 100 clusters. Um, quasar microlensing um, to determine the accretion structure of, of 1,000 strongly lensed AGN and the IMF of the lensing galaxies. And we'll also be able to look at, for example, the properties of high redshift galaxies that have been lensed um, that we normally wouldn't be able to observe without the effect of lensing. But there are many others that I haven't mentioned um, and part of the challenge with strong lensing, um, and is kind of reflected in the little postage stamps that you see here, is that there's a huge diversity of morphologies and uh, different scales of lensing from individual galaxies to quasars to cluster lenses. And this actually, um, if you move on to the next slide, please, Fred, is one of the main challenges for strong lensing in that discovery is a real problem. Um, the complex morphologies, um, the fact that these are really rare systems, only one in 10 to the four galaxies will be capable of producing a strong lensing signature. And automated methods generally have a very high false positive rate. Uh, there are many things in the universe that mimic what strong lensing looks like. This leads to a much harder um, computational problem, uh, both in algorithms and machine learning, um, to recognize what those uh, systems are. And that actually means currently we're using a lot of visual inspection through citizen science to help us refine those samples that we get from the automated system. So what we're working towards for Rubin is to develop a multi-method discovery system that encapsulates many different algorithms as well as visual inspection in line um, with the EPO efforts um, and also to incorporate fast modeling which has been a challenge in strong lensing to date uh, to help us sift through this and reduce the false positive rate in the samples that we find. So there's a lot of work going on within the collaboration to develop those modeling methods. Um, we're also looking very closely or with um, the dark matter, um, sorry, the, the data management stack to develop what we need for strong lensing um, and that's all ongoing. We've also contributed to observing strategy considerations, um, primarily uh, with the DES strong lensing working group on the uh, time delay sources 
um, and microlensing, but we also have uh, kind of less stringent requirements um, in terms of seeing and an early reference survey for the static lenses. Um, we're working on our science roadmap um, task that we're developing right at the moment. Um, and we're also looking at follow-up strategies um, and requirements, because it's going to be absolutely impossible to follow up all of these um, lenses and each science case has a different requirement in follow-up. So this is quite an important aspect of what uh, we will need to discover or need to define uh, to, act, to really extract the maximal information from the strong lenses that we discover. If you can move to the next slide, please, Fred. Um, so just quickly going over the future, we're going to be running some discovery and modeling challenges. We're we'll working on infrastructure to, perform, uh, to provide those strong lensing candidates to the community, as well as our analysis structure. Um, we're working on commissioning and early science planning. And we're also, as you've heard in the other talks, uh, building our connections to other science collaborations of which we have many. Uh, in particular, we've just recently received funding from the Enabling Science Fund. Uh, to have a cross-collaboration meeting focused on strong lensing, and that will be the first uh, Rubin-wide strong lensing meeting uh, that will happen. Uh, we're very keen for anyone to join us who has any interests that relate to strong lensing. Um, we have a very low threshold in that we welcome anyone to join us who has the interest, and you can join up at the URL that's shown on the slide there. Thanks. Thank you both. Unfortunately, this uh, pair went over time. We're all going a little bit over time. So I'm going to skip the Q&A. Keep asking questions on Slack and on the Q&A chatbot. And hopefully, we'll be able to ask a question to AGN on Strong Lens in Science collaboration at the end. Um, but I don't want to risk to run over. Um, so just mind my chairs and uh, speakers. Be mindful this will happen uh, if the next pair of talks go. Uh, long as well. So the next pair of talk is uh, the Galaxy Science Collaboration. Sugata uh, Kavira will speak and the strong, uh, the Stars Milky Way and Local Volume Science Collaboration. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Federica. So uh, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about the Galaxy Science Collaboration. Um, so Amanda Banerjee and I chair this collaboration at the moment. It has a, around 200 members. Uh, we are very uh, keen to have new members. Uh, new members are very welcome. There, there are no requirements on time commitment. Um, so the core goal of this collaboration, as you can imagine, is to perform um, extragalactic science over cosmic time, essentially. So in terms of the, the advances which are expected from LSST, uh, there's a vast uh, discovery space um, of faint objects, which is not accessible to uh, sort of past wide area surveys, like let's say the STSS. Um, um, and of course, wide area surveys are what our understanding of galaxy evolution, our statistical understanding of galaxy evolution uh, is predicated uh, on. So uh, normally this is termed the low surface, surface brightness regime, but this includes everything uh, from dwarfs outside a local group to intracluster light. Um, so this is going to be a new regime which is going to be opened up by LSST for galaxy science. Then there's going to be new discovery space uh, for the rarest and most extreme uh, objects, things like uh, mergers, starbursts, high redshift systems. And this is especially true when it's combined, when you combine LSST data with uh, infrared surveys which can probe to higher redshift. And then increasingly what we're finding in the galaxies uh, science collaboration is that there's, there's an there's a intersection with computer science and we are using this intersection to drive new technologies which will be relevant for big data astrophysics, uh, not just for galaxies, but for, uh, but for um, um, all SCs uh, in principle. Uh, next, please, Fed. Okay, so in terms of our activities, so we have monthly telecons, we have face-to-face -face meetings, uh, um, uh, collaboration members have uh, provided a lot of service to committees, for example, the Contributions Evaluation Committee, uh, the Rubin uh, Euclid Working Group, et cetera, et cetera. Most importantly, though, we are, 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 we are developing pipelines which will enable galaxy science uh, for the worldwide LSST community. Uh, so there are pipelines to enable low surface brightness science, uh, to derive physical parameters like uh, redshift, star formation rates, uh, stellar masses, which are going to be critical for galaxy science. Uh, there are pipelines for joint processing of LSST and uh, ground-based near infrared surveys, and these are sort of pixel level uh, joint processing. Uh, the low surface brightness working group is particularly active, so they have four ongoing challenges which look at detecting LSB structures and how best we can do LSB science once you've done, those, uh, done that, uh, that detection. Um, uh, some galaxies members are working on um, AI, so machine learning algorithms for, especially for fast image analysis, things like galaxy morphology, 
morphological classification. Uh, and then, of course, there's simulation work using both uh, semi-analytics and also full hydro simulations uh, to actually make the predictions that we need uh, that will then be tested by LSST. So next, please. Okay, so let's, uh, let me just wrap up. So in terms of the future, I think uh, we're going to continue to have these telecoms and regular meetings. Uh, the Galaxy's SC is going to uh, provide input into survey strategy and commissioning fields. Uh, so we are looking forward to coordinating with um, uh, several international collaborators who will hopefully join uh, formally uh, uh, the, 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 the ecosystem after September. Uh, and these uh, collaborators will bring a huge uh, uh, amount of expertise and resources through international data access centers, telescope time, software infrastructure efforts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are coordinating with Euclid through the Euclid uh, Rubin uh, Working Group or the Rubin Euclid Working Group, sorry. Uh, and of course, we expect uh, some of these pipelines that I mentioned to come to fruition. So there, there should be in two or three years time, uh, enhanced pipelines to do low surface brightness science. Uh, we expect to have these value-added catalogs of physical parameters that we need, uh, and there should be multi-wavelength catalogs which combine LSST data with data at other wavelengths, uh, which will be key for, uh, for Galaxy's work. Uh, so let me just uh, finish off by saying uh, this is a point that's been made several times before. Uh, a lot of the preparatory work and the studies with using precursor data that we're doing, let's say using the Hyper Supreme Cam surveys, is unfunded. So I think it's, it's unlikely that the Galaxy Science Collaboration will be ready to fully exploit LSST when it gets going uh, without further, uh, further funding. So let me just uh, finish by saying uh, um, we, are, uh, we welcome new members. Uh, so if, if this is the kind of thing that uh, you think you might be interested in, uh, then please get in touch with uh, Amanda and I, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. The next talk is Stars Milky Way and Local Volume Science Collaboration. Um, Peregrine McGee will speak. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Peregrine McGee, uh, one of the three co-chairs for Stars Milky Way and Local Volume, along with Will Clarkson and John Gieses. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we uh, support one of the four key science themes of LSST, which is the formation and structure of the Milky Way. And of course, not only the Milky Way, but uh, the satellite galaxies and local group members. Uh, we are organized into seven very diverse science working groups. Uh, solar neighborhood, star clusters, variable stars, so strong tie-in with TVS, the galactic bulge, galactic structure and interstellar medium, the Magellanic clouds, and also near-field cosmology. Uh, so we have ties to TVS and also uh, because of near-field cosmology and local probes of dark matter, we're, we, we have a connection with, with DESC. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we working on right now? Uh, first of all, uh, we're trying to help the, the project help uh, a Milky Way science. Uh, so we're working on the metric analysis framework and figures of merits uh, to support the observing strategy. Uh, we're looking at commissioning needs, uh, especially like for precision uh, validation of astrometry. Uh, looking at early science goals. Uh, internally, uh, we have a number of task forces uh, that we're managing. We're working on liaisons with other science collaborations with the project. And we're also reaching out to uh, new potential community members in the community. Uh, we have a, a series of science roadmaps that we're updating. Uh, we're working with our internal working groups to prepare for LCC science, and we're in active collaboration, for example, with TVS. We had a joint meeting uh, virtually at Delaware in 2019. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So for the future, uh, we really want to broaden the member participation. Uh, we're going to continue to work with other science collaborations, particularly the TVS and DESC. Uh, we need to update a lot of our internal documents like our website, publication policy. Uh, right now our membership structure is just a single tier, a very low bar for, for admission. Uh, we're doing a lot of work for our input on the living strategy uh, because, Sorry. and uh, you know, and we're working on areas of LCC's performance that are particular to galactic uh, studies, uh, unlike some other fields, we have to work on how to do photometry and astrometry in very crowded fields, in the bulge, in the clouds, in the plane in the Milky Way. 
And of course, as other collaborations have said, one of our main challenge is that our member effort is entirely voluntary. Uh, so it's often difficult to uh, devote uninterrupted time and effort uh, because we all have day jobs. Uh, so who should join? If you have any interest in galactic science, as you see our, our, our working groups are very diverse. Uh, early, early career investigators, graduate students, uh, you know, uh, here's our website on the uh, science.lcc.org. And uh, that's what I have. Great, so we are a little behind. Maybe we have time for um, to say yes or no question for Galaxy and a yes or no question for Sun's Milky Way local volume. Manda, do you have a quick question for the Galaxy I see? Um, yeah, I, I'll ask a, a, a general one. So uh, uh, I'll pass this to Sagata. Do you see um, interactions with the computer science, data science community? And uh, it's, it's not quite a yes or no question, sorry, but I think Sagata can answer it probably quite quickly. Yeah, so I, I briefly touched on it uh, in my slide. So, so um, most of what we're doing at the moment is to look at unsupervised machine learning, because as you can imagine, the, the sheer size of the LSST data set means that even you know, supervised machine learning um, is going to be difficult to do. Uh, so that's, gonna, that's, that's one, of the f uh, one of the things people are focusing on uh, to how, how, you know, in terms of image analysis. So how would you do um, galaxy morphology, for example? Uh, using unsupervised ML. Um, so that's the focus, but I think we're going to expand into other intersections with computer science, hopefully, and in the future. Thank you. Will Clarkson, do you have one super quick question for Peregrine or for yourself? Um, there is a question from Tom Wilson that it's not a yes or no question. So Tom, apologies, we can answer that on Slack. Yes or no question would be, um, what, what is the single most urgent task facing SMW or V right now? Right, and the answer for that, uh, actually there's two, one, one is our uh, internal restructuring, uh, and, but in terms of com uh, communication with the rest of the, uh, the project is uh, finishing our, our feedback to the observing strategy. Excellent, with that we move on to solar system science collaboration in our fast paced uh, session on the SCs and David Trillin will be speaking for the science collaboration, the solar system science collaboration. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Trilling. I'm one of the two co-chairs. The other is Meg Schwamm from Queen's University, Belfast. Um, we have a great collaboration. We have about 130 members, as you see here. Um, Fed mentioned at the beginning that solar system science is one of the four pillars of the LSST project. Um, and so we're really excited about the, the new data sets and what, what new science we're going to do. In bold here, you see five, more than five million solar system small bodies to be observed in more than a billion observations. Um, there's our webpage at the very bottom. Uh, Fed, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, here's our something like our structure. We have two co-chairs. We have several working groups. You can see the names here. Um, I think you can go to the next slide there. People can study that on their own time. We have a number of active projects that are all related to um, preparations. Uh, some of them are consortia or collaboration wide. Some are a uh, few investigators working together and, and you know, subsets. Um, we've been hosting readiness sprints for the past few years, once a year, which has been really great to get anywhere from 15 to, in this case, more than 50 members uh, together to both talk about definitions and plans and also do some hacking. And on the right, you see we had a simulation that we were able to work through. We can talk about details later on as you like. Um, we have a number of white papers, um, software tools, and as with some other collaborations, we're having an EDI workshop uh, later on. I think there's one more slide, Fed, thank you. Um, in the future, of course, we are intimately involved in giving uh, feedback on survey cadence. That's quite important for solar system observations, perhaps more so than almost any other, or, or very important uh, along with a few other collaborations. It's critical for us to make sure that the definitions are going to be useful. Um, we are, of course, developing community software. Um, there's a third bullet here. There's an outstanding question about um, community observing follow-up, and there's a lot of thought that needs to be done there. 
And of course, someday we'll all be able to be in person together and continue our, our readiness sprints together. Who should join? Data rights holders who are interested. We have, I wouldn't say we have a low bar. I would say we have no bar for participating in our collaboration. So come on out and, and see what we're up to. Thank you. Thank you, David. And last, but certainly not least, Informatic and Statistics Science Collaboration. Tom Loredo will speak. Thanks, Fed. Um, I'm a co-chair of the ISSC with Chad Schaefer, a statistician at Carnegie Mellon, and Chad did most of the work on these slides. Thanks, Chad. Um, there are about 75 members in the ISSC, and it's an interdisciplinary uh, science collaboration. It was formed in 2009. I believe it's the only from scratch new uh, science collaboration formed years after uh, LSST, now Rubin, uh, started. Um, it brings together people from astronomy and data science with a, whose research focuses strongly on uh, statistics and machine learning methods to uh, develop sophisticated methods of data analysis for Rubin science, but also to push the frontiers of data science itself in the directions to address the unique science goals of LSST and the scalability and complexity uh, challenges of LSST. Next slide. So some of our uh, current activities, we have roughly monthly uh, webinars that are either tutorials or seminars on LSST science challenges. Some of the topics are listed here, deep learning, conditional density estimation, transient classification. The most recent one was an overview of the desk tomography challenge. We have a Slack channel and a community forum for statistics and machine learning questions. Um, uh, ISSC members were among the PIs in uh, several of the enabling science funded activities that the corporation, LSST Corporation, has funded, including an AGN classification challenge proposal, uh, a, a classification broker workshop, and a, a Bayesian deep learning workshop that may be held in Paris or may be held online next year. Uh, many members are uh, about a quarter of the members are in other SCs and are doing all kinds of research. Some of the, the most active topics are listed here. Photo Z estimation, likelihood free inference for cosmological parameter estimation, um, classification tasks in uh, time series and AGN star separation. Um, the Vanderbilt University group working on a, a new broker is uh, among the ISSC membership. We're working on model misspecification, how to handle it uh, for luminosity functions and other distributions in astronomy. And then last slide. For the future, we're one of a few of the SCs that doesn't have a, a, an official charter. So if you're interested in joining, this is a great time to join to help us fix our future structure. We're trying to increase interaction with other SCs, um, especially to Get, encourage members to join other SCs in addition to the ISSC. And we're, try, we're also exploring ideas for working groups unique to the uh, ISSC, including outreach working groups. So anyone interested in pushing the boundaries of data science uh, should uh, contact us to join. We had a new member just yesterday on AGN classification. Thanks. Outstanding. So we do have time for one question for solar system and one question for informatic and statistics. Uh, Bryce, do you have a question for David or for yourself to answer for solar system? Yes, uh, we have a question in Slack from Chuck Claver asking, is there any solar system science that could be gained from the analysis of meteor trail statistics in the LSSE data set? This is David. Chuck, the answer is yes. We can talk more about it as you like. Thank you very much for keeping the answer quick. And uh, Chad Schiffer, the other co-chair of Informatic and Statistics Science Collaboration, do you have a question for yourself? Or for yeah, we actually have a great question here of what are your preferred uh, mode of interaction between the ISSC and the others? How would you prefer people to interact? And I would generalize that to what's the best way of initiating that sort of an in interaction. Tom or Chad? Oh, you're asking me to, okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, so the, community and the, the community and the Slack channels are, uh, are the, probably the, the best way. And of course, you can also just email uh, chat, chat or I as well. So. so let me actually give a little pitch for a new community page, which I think is called um, 
informatic and statistics. Uh, sorry, I don't remember the name of the new of the new topic, but that was uh, initiated by a collaboration with the community engagement team and the ISSC. So there's a new page on community to ask your favorite data science, machine learning questions, and also a Slack channel dedicated to that. Right. Yeah, and can I just add quickly, Fed, that I, I would like for the Slack and the community page to be available for any level of questions. If you have a quick question, you have something more complex, the idea is that it could be a resource for everybody for any sorts of questions, your grad students, your postdocs, whatever. I'd like it to be an open forum. That's a great point. And I myself has, have used it to ask questions about things that I wanted to teach, but I didn't quite know well enough. Um, and I got great answers. So um, I owe the AGN and Science Club in, in strong lensing uh, one question, um, and I hope we'll get there. We caught up on time a bit. I just want to spend a couple of minutes before talking about overall a very core and important topic that is uh, really um, at the heart of all the science collaborations, particularly at this time, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, obviously, the social events and the violence that we have witnessed have revamped our interest in making sure that the science collaboration are an inclusive and an equitable space for all of its members. So each science collaboration has its own diversity, equity, and inclusion approach and initiatives. Uh, for example, DESK and TVS have recently started groups, TVS as a call to action. Uh, but we also have interest in coordinating these efforts both between the science collaborations and with the rest of the Rubin ecosystem, um, as well as with the entire community. Some of the initiatives that we're undertaking are um, simplifying and making more approachable onboarding, uh, onboarding of new members. Uh, we have always uh, focused on education and education to underserved communities. We have submitted a number of proposals to that end. More recently, we have most recently, we have submitted a program for a boot camp that lowers the barrier to entry into the Rubin science um, environment that was specifically targeted to recruit members in um, institutes that serve underserved communities, such as HSBCUs, uh, sorry, HBCUs and minority serving institutes. Uh, unfortunately, that proposal was declined by NSF. We also are establishing a DEI council that will see representations of all of the science collaborations and that we hope will work in concert with the Rubin and Aura um, efforts on DEI. And also, let me give a pitch to the DEI sessions. I hope that we'll see a lot of people from science collaboration chairs and the DEI session on Friday. I want to also, as some of the chairs have pointed out, uh, highlight some of the difficulties that the science collaborations and as an organization are having, and particularly that the people that are involved and believe in this organization as an important component of the Rubin ecosystem are facing, namely the chairs, but not only some of the other people that devote a lot of their service time to the science collaborations. The science collaborations are not funded, and we are encountering difficulties getting, um, getting funded for science activities as well as infrastructure activities, uh, because it's really a quite new concept to have such a large organization that is self-organized and self-managed. And we're not really finding proper venues to get financial support within uh, the agencies. Um, and also what that in practice means is that the people that um, only not, not everybody can commit time and effort to a significant level to the organization. So all of the chairs that you heard speaking are largely volunteer, largely or entirely volunteer their time as service time and they're doing far more than a regular academic contract allows um, in terms of service. Um, the fact that we are not, that we can't find fund funds to support our infrastructure with some exceptions, uh, and I should acknowledge the desk is partially funded by DOE for this purpose, is that this limits the, num the available personnel that can spend time and effort on these infrastructure tasks and it overloads the motivated few, uh, the chairs that you heard speaking, uh, namely, and a few others. Um, so it generally limits the goals that are achievable by the science collaborations, both scientifically and in terms of uh, community onboarding and community, um, and community um, reach, not outreach, but reach within the scientific community. 
We are members of a number of committees and certainly there's no requirement that it would be the same few people that are members on those committees. In fact, the committees would benefit from a more diverse set of voices, um, but few people are in the position in which they can commit the required amount of time to be in um, an organizing position inside of the science collaborations. That should not scare you from joining a science collaboration. Uh, you will not be charged with significant, over, significant service uh, requests as you join the science collaboration, but if you wish to contribute to the organizations, um, this, um, this is where the science collaboration are at this time. Uh, and generally, um, because we are a, a self-organized and self-supported organization, um, any um, I, I wanna I wanna encourage people that interact with us to consider this. Consider that a lot of us are primarily devoting our time um, to this on a volunteer basis, and um, to the organizations that we interact with within the Rubin ecosystem. Um, helping it, it would help us to have more lead time to deadlines of course this is um this is an obvious point everybody ha is held by more lead time to deadlines uh, but particularly because we are self-organized uh, uh, short deadlines and um and the uh, changes of deadlines is really detrimental to our work and our ability to delegate tasks uh, we need a lot of support for infrastructure building. I would like us to think about this as infrastructure building and preparatory science rather than um, really service because that's what we're doing. And I have a few uh, tips here for things that we could do to improve this, but I want to, ah, no, I ran out of time. Well, in that case, I want to acknowledge that Gordon Richards and Franz Lauer from AGN were uh, willing to act as moderator, and I didn't leave them a chance to, as well as Timo Anguita for Strong Lens in Science Collaboration, um, who is the co-chair of the Science Collaboration. And I think we can close, uh, but uh, Melissa had a quick reminder. Yeah, I just wanted to close out the session and say thanks to all the speakers today and to Fed for coordinating this whole presentation. Please, a round of applause on the Slack and this plenary channel. And please continue the discussions in the, the Slack channel for this plenary as well um, for the rest of the today and for the rest of the week. If you have any questions or need help with anything, remember there's a help channel on Slack. And the next thing that happens is we take a 30 minute break and then the next set of sessions start at 10.30 a.m. Pacific and you can find out what those sessions are in the uh, PCW website. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good break. I'll see you Thank later. you everybody. And we'll answer all of your questions and more questions on Slack.